Hello everyone, my name is Erin Belange. I'm a fourth year PhD student and I'm excited to talk to you today about some of my ongoing research. So at some point in time in our lives, I can imagine that everyone in this room, maybe even numerous times, you've been prescribed antibiotics or had to take antibiotics. I know for sure I definitely have. Maybe this was because you had a sore throat, an ear infection, or even a skin rash that wasn't going away. Or maybe there was something more serious going on, like you had a surgery that required antibiotics either pre or post-operation in order to prevent an infection from occurring. We have all relied on antibiotics at some point in time in our lives to do their job, which is to essentially kill any pathogenic bacteria that may be infecting us. But now imagine you take those same antibiotics for that same sore throat or ear infection, and this time the infection just doesn't go away. The bacteria, pathogenic bacteria that are infecting you decide to fight back through resistance mechanisms and are no longer treated by these old antibiotics that you're used to taking. This could be extremely scary and is an ongoing public health crisis, not only in the United States, but also worldwide. In the CDC's 2019 Antibiotic Resistance Report, they estimated that each year there were 2.8 million antibiotic-resistant cases occurring, with 35,000 deaths due to antibiotic resistance. So there's a current and unmet need to identify novel antibiotics in, over, in order to overcome these antibiotic-resistant superbugs and make them susceptible to treatment again. The discovery of antibiotics dates back to the late 1920s, with the majority of antibiotics that we use today being identified around the 1950s. Since that time period, there's been a steady decline in the number of antibiotics that have been identified, with the last two decades being extremely void of getting new antibiotics to the market. This discovery void emphasizes the importance of what academic institutions like ourselves are able to do, where we can take on exploratory projects in order to identify new antibiotics and start overcoming this antibiotic resistance crisis. Current antibiotics target a variety of different cellular processes, some of which are being highlighted here. And one way that we could develop new antibiotics is to identify new compounds that inhibit these same cellular processes or have the same mechanism of action as current antibiotics, but may have different chemical structures. Alternatively, we can identify entirely novel antibacterial targets that then we can apply uh, rational drug design to in order to develop antibiotics specific for those brand new targets. My lab has identified a novel antibacterial target through a fishing expedition with that antibacterial target occurring within cellular metabolism. To understand metabolism, we think of our bodies and our digestive system. With the food that we eat every day, our digestive system is responsible for taking that food, breaking it down into smaller molecules that then we can use as energy to go about our everyday lives. Bacteria have the same requirement for food that they have to break down into smaller molecules that they can use as energy in order to survive and replicate. One of the examples of a nutrient or a food that bacteria use is sugars, or what we think of as candy. This is a metabolic pathway map that highlights a subset of sugar breakdown or metabolism pathways, with each sugar being highlighted in a different color. When we're thinking of bacterial metabolism, there's high sequence to the order of events, where sugar A has to be interconverted to intermediate B, to be converted into intermediate C, and then finally being converted into inter or intermediate D in order to have successful metabolism of these sugars. And so one of the important intermediates that has to be generated and then de degraded in order to have successful sugar metabolism are sugar phosphates. Our lab and others have found that if you inhibit the enzyme that normally consumes the sugar phosphate, or you create a mutation in the gene that encodes that enzyme for the sugar phosphate, this leads to an accumulation of the sugar phosphate intermediate and ultimately has wide-ranging toxic effects on bacterial cells. This is a phenomenon referred to as sugar phosphate toxicity. Our lab has extensive experience studying sugar phosphate toxicity within the fructose asparagine metabolism pathway in salmonella. And salmonella is a foodborne pathogen that we use in our research as our model pathogen. In order to assess sugar phosphate toxicity, we can look at growth curves. And so in a wild type or normal salmonella cell that is able to utilize fructose asparagine that has all the enzymes necessary to break that nutrient down, we see normal bacterial growth as indicated by the blue line. However, when we induce sugar phosphate toxicity in salmonella, in this example, by creating a mutation in the FRAB gene of the fructose asparagine pathway, 
This leads to the accumulation of that sugar phosphate, 6 PFS, or 6 phosphofructose aspartate, and we sub see severe growth inhibition. In my work, we're expanding on this foundational fraud B study to assess the susceptibility of salmonella to other sugar phosphate toxicities. In order to do this, we're creating mutations in these genes that are highlighted here in red, and then asking the question whether or not when you provide the sugar that feeds into those deficient pathways or feeds into those mutations, that results in sugar phosphate toxicity, as would be indicated by inhibition of growth. When we evaluate, or we constructed seven mutations and then evaluated their growth, first in media alone, as indicated by the black circles. In media alone, we see that all of these mutant strains of salmonella are able to grow normally. They have normal bacterial growth. However, when we provide the sugar that feeds into each one of these sufficient pathways, which would potentially induce sugar phosphate toxicity, indicated by the color lines, we see that there's severe growth inhibition of five out of our seven mutants. So specifically, we're seeing sugar phosphate toxicity occurring in a mutant of GALI, a GALT mutant, a RAW-D mutant, an ARID mutant, and an MTLD. Uh, in contrast to these mutants that are undergoing sugar phosphate toxicity, our negative data, our GLT-D mutant and our MAN-A mutant, we can see that in the presence of the sugar that should cause toxicity, we do not see growth inhibition, and thus these mutants are not undergoing sugar phosphate toxicity. Upon the successful identification of these five mutations or mutants that cause sugar phosphate toxicity in vitro, we then have to move into an in vivo system to translate our findings in order to validate these as drug targets. We need to understand whether or not salmonella in an infection-relevant system is undergoing sugar phosphate toxicity and if sugar phosphate toxicity would prevent salmonella from surviving in this model. For us, we use an animal model, and in our animal model, we first treat our mice or we use a mouse model, and in our mouse model, we first treat our mice with the antibiotic streptomycin. This antibiotic disrupts the normal microbiota and ultimately allows salmonella to, or promotes salmonella colonization and survival within the gut. After 24 hours of that antibiotic treatment, we then infect our mice with a one-to-one -one ratio of a wild type and then a sugar phosphate mutant. And this allows us to directly compare the fitness or the ability of each of these strains to survive within one mouse. At four days post-infection, we euthanize the mice, we harvest the cecum, which is a, an organ off of the large intestine, and then we plate for colony forming units, or CFUs, to quantitate the abundance of each one of these strains. Additionally, we showed in our growth curve and our in vitro assay that we required sugar be provided in order to observe that inhibited phenotype. And so to ensure the mutant has access to the sugar necessary to cause sugar phosphate toxicity, we've provided sugar in the drinking water of the mice. Our resulting data is showing the quantitations of both our wild type strain and our sugar phosphate mutant strain, with the wild type strain being highlighted in white and the sugar phosphate mutant strain being highlighted as a color. And so out of the five mutants that we tested in our in vivo system, we find that four of these mutants have a severe fitness defect, as indicated by the reduction in the number of colony forming units or CFUs that were recovered compared to their wild type. Ultimately, our data shows that in our uh, model organism, Salmonella, in addition to seeing sugar phosphate toxicity in the fructose asparagine pathway by mutating the FRAB uh, gene. We can also induce sugar phosphate toxicity by targeting the GAL-E gene of the galactose pathway, the MTLD gene of the mannitol pathway, the RAW-D gene of the rhamnose pathway, and the ARID gene of the arabinose pathway. In our studies, we have assessed sugar phosphate toxicity in vitro and then assessed the, uh, the effects of sugar phosphate toxicity for the survival of salmonella in vivo. And we did all this using genetic models. These genetic or genetic mutations. These genetic mutations serve as a really good proxy uh, for what would happen if we targeted at the enzyme level. And so in moving forward, or they serve as a good proxy for validating this as a drug target, but moving forward in a real world application, we need to target the enzyme that would normally consume the sugar phosphate in order to induce sugar phosphate toxicity. And so this would require identification of small molecule inhibitors or antibiotics and then essentially inhibited inhibition of these enzymes would have the same resulting effects that we have seen with genetic mutations. Last 
lastly, uh, we demonstrate that sugar phosphate toxicity is effective in salmonella, but we strongly believe that sugar phosphate toxicity couldn't be induced in other pathogens and could be relevant as a therapeutic strategy against other pathogens and warrants further explanation. Ultimately, sugar phosphate toxicity provide a new avenue for killing of bacteria. They'll support the identification of novel antibiotics and ultimately support our goal of fighting this re antibiotic resistance crisis. Thank you.